The number one skill that separates junior and senior employees across any job family is thinking in systems instead of tasks. Now, most people don't realize this, so let me make it painfully clear with a few examples. In software engineering, a junior engineer is asked to design a single API endpoint. A senior engineer is asked to design an entire service, the APIs, the databases, failure cases, and scaling, the entire system. In marketing, a junior marketer will be asked to create one asset for a campaign. A senior marketer designs the entire campaign itself. Audience segmentation, messaging, distribution, landing pages, analytics, and even success criteria the entire campaign system. In design, a junior designer will create one asset or one mockup in Figma. A lead designer will define the entire design system. Typefaces, colors, templates, component libraries, documentation, everything the junior designers need to work 10 times faster. Now, these jobs sound completely different, but here's the thing. All of those senior people have the same system design skill set. And once you learn it, you become invaluable, both as an individual contributor or a manager. And you don't have to worry about AI replacing your coding job because your real skill set isn't coding. It's your ability to design systems that make teams, tools, and technology work together. Now, the best part is every great system consists of the same three components, requirements, tools, and trade-offs. I'm gonna break down each one of these, walk through examples across multiple disciplines, and show you how to think like a senior in any job family. So let's start with the first ingredient, requirements. Now, in my opinion, this is actually the single most important part of system design, and it's also the most overlooked. Requirements is not about architecture, tools, or selecting a database. It's about gathering information until you have a crystal clear picture of what the system needs to accomplish and what success looks like for you. Think of this phase as detective work. Before you can design anything, you need to understand what the problem Problem is, who's involved, how it's currently getting done, if it is, what are the constraints, and what exactly happens today step by step. Most systems fail not because of bad technology, but because the people designing them didn't understand the requirements up front. So the first thing you need to do is research reality. Shadow the team using the current system and understand exactly what they're doing. Ask the annoying questions, list out the edge cases, and find their biggest pain points. And this is key. Document the unwritten rules that people forget to mention. People will often say one thing and do something completely different. These are your engineers who manually alter a prod database or a marketer who doesn't use the design system because it's too annoying and takes longer than just redoing it themselves every time. Okay, now before you automate anything, do it yourself manually. Now, people will hammer this lesson into you if you've ever built a startup, but it matters everywhere. When you do something manually, you actually personally experience what the friction is, what steps actually matter, and which ones you might be able to skip, what steps are error prone, and which ones are important enough to want to automate. Every time I've done this, I found out stuff beyond what I had already written down on a whiteboard. So you understand the workflow, but now you need to understand where automation is actually valuable. Are you doing the same copy paste task 200 times a week? Is there a manual approval step that usually takes 48 hours? Is there a report you're spending four hours a week to put together that nobody reads? These patterns tell you where automation or tooling will actually move the needle and where it won't. And this is key. Automation is not a blanket solution. It's a targeted surgery. You automate the parts that are predictable, repeatable, and high leverage. You do not automate the parts that require judgment, creativity, or human intuition. Now, up until this point, you should not have thought about a single tool you can use to build this system because the requirements inform the tools. So now you should have a clear idea of the purpose, the constraints, the bottlenecks, and the tasks that should remain manual versus the ones that need to be automated. Once we have these, choosing the tools is just implementation detail. All right, but now that we do have the requirements, let's talk about how you can pick the tools. Tools are not only technology, they're anything that helps the system function. And to me, they fall into three categories, software tools, business tools, and human tools. A lot of people only think about the first one, but the other two might actually be more important. In software engineering, tools like databases, queues, event orchestrators, autoscalers are different software tools you can use. And the best course of action is usually just to pick the tools that everybody else at your company already uses. People know how to work on those tools, build with them, and maintain them. Don't propose a new tech stack just because it's the cool thing to do. The same goes for other disciplines. If your team's already using Figma, don't suggest switching to Banner Bear unless you absolutely have to. Now, next we have the business tools. These are not SaaS products, and they're probably the least sexy part of your entire system. Now, in my mind, most of these tools are actually just a simple process. This could be a checklist, a template, a spreadsheet, a weekly meeting, a documented SOP, or even a shared Slack channel where somebody can ask a question if they get blocked. If there's an edge case and somebody has a legitimate question, an extra queue is not going to save you, but asking somebody who's been at the company for 10 years will. And these tools reduce friction and make outcomes more repeatable and predictable. Okay, now the last category, people.
people. Now, this sounds kind of weird to say, but people are tools too. They have roles, responsibilities, and incentives. And some requirements can't be solved with code or automated mechanisms. They require a dedicated owner or a clear review process. If your requirement says human judgment required, then a human is the tool. Senior people think in systems that include humans, not just tools. And if you've done your requirements properly, you should now know when you need a database versus a spreadsheet, or if a Python script or human should be handling a task that needs to get done every day. And here are some quick examples around where you might use a different tool across different disciplines. In software engineering, if debugging is too painful or your service is going down before you can find it, you might add something like an analytics dashboard and an on-call team of engineers. In marketing, if your leads are dropping off between the landing page and the checkout, you might introduce A-B testing of your checkout page or a CRM to retarget the people that didn't convert. And in shipping operations, if you're losing track of orders between the time that they arrive at a warehouse and when they get sent out to a customer's house, you might introduce a barcode scanning app and clear SOPs for how packages should be handled. But of course, no matter what tools you pick or what requirements you identify, you're not going to be able to solve everything, and that's where you're going to have to make trade-offs. Every single system, no matter how big or small it is, is going to force you to make trade-offs. And a lot of people get stuck trying to build the perfect solution when it's just not possible. Every single decision you make will be trading off something else. Let me give you a couple examples. Speed versus quality cost versus performance, automation versus flexibility, security versus convenience, complexity versus control, human judgment versus machine consistency. If you work in industry, you probably can think of three examples where you've seen each of those off the top of your head. So how do you actually evaluate what trade-offs you should be making? Number one, the risk analysis. Now, risk analysis and mitigation is actually an entire field, but I'll try to break it down as simply as possible. So the expected value of a risk is equal to the probability of a failure times the cost of the failure. That's it. So this is how you can get a simple dollar value amount to calculate how much a risk is actually worth. So let's say you're running a website and there's a 5% chance that it fails every quarter. If it fails, you can expect about $200,000 in losses. This might factor in different things like inventory not sold during that time, customer trust lost, or the ability to not capture new leads during that time frame. So what's the cost of this? Well, it's 5% times 200,000, which brings us to a total cost of $10,000. So the risk is worth 10,000 in expected losses. So is it worth spending $300,000 to fix it, well, not for 30 years. But is it worth five to 20,000 to reduce it or fix it? Yes. This is how people quantify risk and trade-offs instead of guessing. So when you're making your trade-off decisions, look both qualitatively and quantitatively at the decisions you're making. Then decide what to optimize, acknowledge that risks always exist and make that clear to everybody using your product and indicate how you can resolve those risks in the future if needed. So when you put these three pieces together, requirements, tools, and trade-offs, system design becomes a universal skill that will get you extremely far in your career. When you go to work next week, I challenge you to analyze some of the systems that you work with every day. How were they built? What trade-offs were made? Who designed them? And would you design it the same way? Or maybe you do something different. Repeatedly thinking through and designing systems all the time is how you can quickly level up that muscle. If you enjoyed this video and you're a software engineer, you'll love the content on the rest of my channel. And if you want to get my newsletter where I break down different system design concepts every week, links in the description. See you guys next time.